Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Wow. Wow, what a blessing it is to see this room filled with such vibrant Jewish life and learning together, especially today. It is such a privilege to welcome you all into this space, to welcome you to Temple Emmanuel. It is a blessing to partner with Hadar, with Rabbi Eli Lehman. Thank you so much. And wow, Rabbi Shai Held, Rabbi Mark Baker, are you all in for a treat? Thank you so much, Michelle. Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to be here to have all of our community partners with Hadar and Hadar Boston, folks coming from all across the region, to be able to be here for a very special morning as we celebrate, really celebrate, the publication of a work that's been going on, that Rabbi Shai Held has been teaching for over 20 years on this topic, and now we get to hold it in our hands. Um, and with this kickoff here in Boston this morning, Rabbi Shai is on a whirlwind tour. He's going to Philadelphia next, and North Carolina, and everywhere. Uh, but it's a real privilege for us to be here this morning with him. My name is Rabbi Eli Lehman. I'm the director of Hadar Boston. Um, thank you, thank you. It's been wonderful to learn with many of you at lots of our uh, learning and workshops and tefillah and music and Torah events that have been happening. There are many more scheduled, um, so be on the lookout for all of those. I don't want to take more time from the treat that we're in this morning. I will be coming around with uh, note cards and pens. If you have questions that you would like to ask uh, of Rav Shai or Rabbi Baker, uh, please just raise your hand and I'll come around with a note card and pen and then I'll collect them back. Thank you, Rabbi Baker from CJP, for also being here with us this morning. It's a real privilege and honor for us. And Rav Shai, both of you, my teachers for decades now, it's wonderful to be together. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Shai and I were both commenting, this is incredible. Look around at this turnout on a Sunday morning. Um, this is really amazing. It says something about every one of you who's here this morning. Um, I think it says something about our, our greater Boston Jewish community and our commitment to learning and Torah and love. Um, and um, I really feel like I'm sitting here as a friend of Shai, who's equally excited about the release of this book, um, but also uh, when I think about my role as a leader of this community and at this moment in time and where we are at this moment in history, um, Shai said to me earlier, like, thanks for doing this. I said, you had me at love. <laughs> and I, I mean it. Like, I, I think there's so many other emotions that so many of us are feeling right now as we struggle to navigate this really, really hard time. And um, as we collectively think about the fact that we, every one of us is regularly shaping the character of this community and our families and our world, um, that we should think very seriously about how we bring more love into it. And I, I can't think about a more important topic um, to be learning together about this morning. So, Chai, thank you for being here. Thank you for writing this book. Um, and I'll say one more thing about it before I ask you my opening question, which is, as someone who's been reading what you've been writing for a long time, um, your Divrei Torah, your commentaries, your Heschel work, it was really special to feel like it's all in here. You could, uh, just as a reader and a, and a student and a learner um, and an observer, uh, you know, it felt like reading in many ways the culmination of your thinking and your mind and your heart for so many years. Um, so I want to open by asking you to share with us, just to tell us before we talk about love itself, tell us a little bit about the journey of writing this book. You know, kind of who are you and, and how did you come to write this book? Thank you, Mark. I'm so grateful for you, to you for doing this. To Temple Emmanuel, where many of you know, I taught some of my first ever forays into the world of adult learning. Some of my Maya students from a million years ago are here. Um, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> um, it really is a joy. Um, I also want to just take a minute to acknowledge my colleague, Rabbi Eli Lehman. You know, Every teacher dreams of having a student like Ellie. Um, so my dream was fulfilled, so thank you. Um, um, so 
The journey that led to this book, with apologies to some of you who have heard me share this maybe even multiple times, it took me a while to realize that this book and really my career more broadly had been very powerfully shaped by two experiences that I had had in the 1990s. By the way, it, does this sound clear? Because it, okay, because I, I hear it in a very weird way. Okay, it's, it's the acoustics up here are bizarre. Um, okay. Um, I was speaking to, this is actually something I talk about in the beginning of the book. I was speaking to a group of fifth year rabbinical students at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And I said in passing, Judaism is a story about a God who loves us and beckons us to love God back. To which a student pretty sneeringly responded, I'm sorry, but that just sounds like Christianity to me. And I was incredibly taken aback by this. And I said to him, you know, it's so interesting that you say that because when I said it, I was thinking of the morning and evening liturgy in which we say, with vast love have you loved us, and you should love the Lord your God. That is a God who loves us and beckons us to love God back. Now, if that makes you think of Christianity, then we have to really talk about just how deeply Jews, even learned committed Jews, have internalized Christian anti-Jewish ideas. Right? You have essentially internalized a story whereby Judaism is a loveless religion and Christianity came into the world to repair what was broken and to fill the hole in Jewish religion and culture. What I realized over the course of traveling and teaching about love in various iterations is that in a really interesting way, this internalization cuts across denominational lines, right? It, it's interesting, this is, I, I get versions of this struggle in reform synagogues and in Hezder Yeshivot in Israel. It's really, really striking how deeply Jews have internalized this story about Judaism. And one of the things I found helpful actually when I was thinking about the book is to read some social science about how minority groups so often internalize the ways that the majority group sees them. And we in America, I think as a relatively privileged community in certain ways, don't really tend to think about the ways that we're a minority, but certainly in religious, I, I say that, I don't know if that's true anymore, but let's you know, bracket the October 7th conversation and just say, you know, I, when it comes to religious terms and theology, we are very much a minority culture, right? Have been for 2,000 years. And I think it's really striking the way we've internalized it. I also came to understand that we had done ourselves a lot of damage as a community when American Jews at a certain point in our history, anxious about assimilation, we began to define Judaism as whatever we imagined Christianity was not. Now, we didn't have a very profound understanding of Christianity. And as a result of that, right, we had an especially unsophisticated understanding of Judaism. I mean, the most dramatic example of this is the one that I always give to people if, they, if they're skeptical about this is how generations of Hebrew school children have been taught that Judaism has no notion of the afterlife. Now, that's because in the American Jewish imagination, Christianity was entirely focused on the afterlife. Therefore, Jews don't believe in the afterlife. The problem with this is that it totally distorts Christianity and Judaism, right? Other than that, it's really helpful. I mean, it's, so now, so I feel like the combination of a Christian story we told and then a reinforcing story, uh, sorry, a Christian story we were told and then a reinforcing story that we told about ourselves had a really toxic impact on the way Jews think about Judaism. And in light of that, you know, the first audience, if you will, that I wrote this book for is Jews in the hope that I could contribute in some small way to a recovery and a restoration of what I think lies at the very heart of the Jewish tradition. The second experience that I don't write about in the book, and I now regret not having written about it, 
is that a few months after that experience with this rabbinical student, I was speaking at an interfaith conference. This was about 1999, um, although the conference was set up as if it was 1954. The kids were divided all day between Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. And so I was, I was teaching the 20 Protestant high school students, and I said also another kind of in-passing comment. I said, remind me, what does Jesus say is the great command? And all 20 hands go up. I call on one, he says very proudly, he tells me about love of God and love of neighbor. So then innocently, I follow up by saying, and remind me, what is Jesus quoting? No hands go up. Not a single one, not a single hand. By the way, the answer is Vayikra and Devarim. <laughs> in case, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And I realized in that moment, oh, it's totally easy for you to have a story in which Christianity comes to repair the lovelessness of Judaism because you have no idea where Jesus was nourished. You have no idea what wells he drank from. And so in many ways, the second audience for this book is Christians who are open to those Christians who are open to reimagining their relationship with the Jewish tradition. Um, and one of the things I've been doing in the last few weeks that's been really, really interesting um, is recording a whole series of podcasts with Christian philosophers and Christian journalists talking about this book and talking about the, how we might reimagine the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, how Christians might learn to think about Judaism differently. There was a moment that was very helpful for me. I was talking to a colleague who has a title I dream of one day having. She is professor of evangelism um, at an Anglican <laughs> seminary. Um, I would like to be professor of evangelism at Hadar. I'm trying. <laughs> Excuse me. And she said to me, <clears throat> you know, our alums come to the continuing ed programs. And I hear again and again. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hear again and again. You know, I know that I can't preach from the pulpit what I learned about Judaism in seminary. I know that it's offensive and obsolete, but I have no idea what to say instead. And she said, my hope is to start giving our alumni your book, which I found very, very moving. And if in some small way I can contribute to a Christian reimagining of what Judaism is, like that would be a great blessing. Um, that's also, really by the way, if you are trying to sell books, they have volume. Totally. <laughs> totally. You know, one of the things just, I... Just noting, just saying. One of the things I always love to remind students, many of you have heard me say this over the years, Milton Himmelfarb used to say, the total number of Jews in the world is smaller than the margin of error in the Chinese census. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is sometimes worth reminding the Jewish community of that. Um, so, you know, those are the, the formative experiences. And then, you know, honestly, Mark, I don't think I realized for many years that I was writing this book. You know, I was talking about the themes that matter to me. I was talking about issues that I thought were submerged, you know, not brought to the surface adequately. And then at a certain point, actually, I mean, it's funny, this is a strange thing to admit, but I was having lunch, this is a sentence I find gross. I was having lunch with my literary agent. Um, <laughs> And she said to me, she said to me, she's like this amazingly um, not beating around the bush character. She said, Shai, what are you trying to say in the world? And without skipping a beat and having no idea where it came from, I said that Judaism is about love and so few people seem to understand that. And she was like, okay, go home, start writing. <laughs> and here we are. And one thing you should know, and I love the way you describe that, because it's almost like the book wrote itself, which probably you should never say to an author who spent like seven years writing a book. My wife, but, my but, wife really begs to differ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if you read it and you haven't had a chance to see it yet, what you'll see is it's about love, but love is actually the, the, the through line that ties together so many other pieces of this book. This book is about love and its relationship to so many other pieces of Judaism, so many other ideas in Jewish theology, ethics, et cetera. So it's really incredible um, how it came together. I wanna ask you one question before, we, before I get to love about you and writing and your relationship with learning, because clearly 
you are um, a teacher par excellence who is uh, a lifelong learner and your love of Torah is palpable in everything you write and when you speak. And you wrote a line in here that just struck me and I wanted to ask you to just share a few words about it. Um, especially for everyone here who's, who's, who's read and, and studied with you before. You wrote, as I've gotten older, I've come to spend more and more time studying and teaching biblical texts. One of the key reasons for this is the sheer power of the Bible's often searing honesty. And I was just, I just wrote a little note to myself. He is drawn to the Bible's searing honesty. Can you just say what that means to you and why yeah. you're so drawn to it? Sure. Um, thank you. By the way, I did not know these questions in advance, in case you're wondering, um, which is how I like it. But um, So here, I think to answer that question, I have to speak very personally for a minute. When I was a kid, although I did not come from an observant family, for interesting reasons, I went to a pretty hardcore yeshiva day school. And... I went through a lot of trauma in those years, including that my father just sort of abruptly died one day when I was 12 years old. And I had internalized a lot of toxic understandings of what it means to be a young man. So I actually remember, I can vividly remember saying to myself, I'm going to act in school like nothing is wrong. And that's how I kind of conducted myself, like, you know, right? And about six or seven months after my father died, I was sitting in class in eighth grade, and we were, we were in our halacha yomit class. So, you know, we would law one piece of Jewish law a day. It was like a 15-minute class. And we were learning brachot, um, and we learned about the bracha, you say upon hearing tragedy, baruch dayan ha'emet, blessed is the true judge. And my armor cracked for a brief moment. I raised my hand, and very, very tentatively I said, what happens if something so bad happens that you can't say the bracha? Now imagine for a minute that you are an eighth grade teacher, and you know that there is a yatom, an orphan, in front of you in the room, and think about how you might have responded to that question. Here's what my teacher said. For a true mamin, that is not a question. Right? For a true believer, that is not a question. And I remember to this day the sensation of wanting to become one of the floor tiles. Right? Just, it was such a devastating, kind of decimating moment. It made me feel like this little nothing. And, you know, I found it of a piece with a larger commitment that I don't remember ever being told, but that I felt was part of kind of the culture, which was that no matter what happened, you were supposed to say, you know, gamzu latova. This is, this, is this is also for the best. And it was a part of Judaism and religious life that I always felt very alienated from. Within a year of that encounter with the teacher, I was totally uninterested in being observant. I was, you know, it was really like a devastating experience. And then, in my 20s, my late 20s, I have even been in my 30s, I started reading the book of Psalms and discovered that many of the biblical writers would have had no patience at all for the idea that the response to tragedy is gamzula tova. The book of Psalms is called Tehillim, which means praises, which is a deeply misleading title because the genre in Psalms that is most present is lament, if you prefer, complaint. <laughs> and some of these psalms are, they're all bold. Some of them are downright brazen. And they shriek and wail in the face of their suffering. Perhaps the most dramatic example of this is late in Psalm 44, arguably the angriest chapter in the Hebrew Bible, when the psalmist yells, Ura! Lama tishan Adonai, wake up, God, why are you sleeping? That's searing honesty. Right? That right there is really searing honesty, and I, I just found it incredibly helpful to discover 
I wasn't the only person who wanted to yell at my teacher. Sefer Tehillim wanted to yell at him too. Because for the true ma'amin, the true believer of the Psalms, that is a question. And how? So that for me was like, it was very, very liberating. And I became very impacted over time by um, a, a formulation that the Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann uses, how the Bible is, on the one hand, a testimony about God. He's Protestant, sounds that way, but, right? The Bible is a testimony about God, but it equally preserves what he calls a counter-testimony. On the one hand, it tells a story of God's relationship with Israel. On the other hand, it tells the story about the ruptures and breaks in that relationship, and they are not only caused by Israel. That's the brazen point. It's not only we who cause the difficulties in the relationship with God. That, I just found that so powerful because if you tell people they have to pretend, so they develop shadow selves or they lie to themselves. So, you know, oh, I'm a, I'm a total believer. Everything is for the good. And meanwhile, like, they're eating themselves alive inside. So what would happen if we had a religious life that refused to sanitize our lives? that made space for pain and devastation. Not as the entirety of our stories, but as part of what life gives us. That, that's what the Bible opened for me. Thank you for that searingly honest answer. And uh, I'm so glad I asked you that question because in addition to the damage that that illusion of the perfect God and the perfect religion can do to people's souls, what you're describing, I would just say it's done a lot of damage to contemporary Jews' relationship with Judaism. Because when Absolutely. you see a religion that demands that of you, at some point you say, this, does not, this is not honest. There's just too big of a gap between at least my understanding of Judaism's claims about the world and my lived experience. And I'll say I think many people are probably in this room because th that's be they've either had the opportunity to learn with you, this is why places like Hadar exist and Pardes and so many other places and synagogues like Temple Emmanuel to say like Judaism actually is honest and relevant and speaks to our lives. And I'll just say for those of us who believe that Torah does have something to say to our lives, we should really take that idea of searing honesty to heart. I think it's, it's critical and essential. Thank you. Thank okay, you. let's talk about love. Um, so since we are um, redeeming Judaism's message of love in this book, and certainly taking away Christianity's monopoly on it. By the way, I think other spiritual traditions also tend to do better on love than Judaism, kind of in the marketplace. But tell us a little bit about what the difference between love in Judaism and love in Christianity, or maybe other spiritual traditions are. Great, so we're starting with hard stuff, great. Um, by the way, I just wanna share that I'm having an identity crisis up here because this microphone says in big capital letters, Michelle. Um, <laughs> and I am, I am really enjoying that. Um, I am hoping that by the end of today, I will sing much nicer than I do now. Um, not that we're not limiting Michelle to that, I promise. Um, so, you know, one of the things that sort of only occurred to me late in the process of writing this book is that maybe I was going to give some readers the false impression that Judaism is really just Christianity avant la lettre, right? That Judaism is just some anticipation of Christian values. And I thought to myself, that is not at all what I'm trying to say, and I ought to make that more explicit, right? Because, I mean, it, it's, it would be obvious to any reader who's paying attention to that, but I, I was nervous, and so I sort of wanted to sort of, as the kids say, name that. Um, what I'm talking about. Some of you actually work in universities. We have to spend a lot of time naming things. If you don't know what I mean, count yourself blessed. Now, so, so, um, I would suggest that there are four major areas where Jews and Christians tend to think about love in different ways. I'm sure there are more. I'll start with two very straightforward ones and then two that I think are a little bit more complex. 
Now, I am now have reached the age when I think to myself, I just said four. The odds of my remembering the fourth by the time I get there are not great, but I'll do my best. Number one is the relationship between love and law. Um, this is especially a difference between Judaism and Lutheran Christianity, but to some degree it's true about Christianity you know, on a larger scale. And that is that the dichotomy that you sometimes see in Christian writing between love on the one hand and law on the other is utterly alien to, and in some sense even antithetical to, biblical and rabbinic spirituality. That is to say that in traditional Judaism, law is a manifestation of love. Back to that liturgy I started with, right? Ahavat olam, you love us, and how did you manifest that? Torah mitzvot, chukim mishpatim, otan olimanata. Michelle, I just realized you were here. I, now I shouldn't have said it. <laughs> I only talk lush and hara about people when they're not in the room. Um, um, so, and, and I think that that's a real kind of, you know, you, you know the sense that the law itself is a gift in the sense that God not only wants to give us the gift of life, but also wants to impart guidance and wisdom as to how to live it. As Deuteronomy never tires of saying about the law, it is litovlach. It is for the purpose of your flourishing. It is to enable your flourishing. Many Christians have a really hard time with that idea. Um, and so love becomes a contrast to law. And by the way, this is something that Jews have also internalized. One of the things I have found really disturbing about a couple of articles that have come out about the book is that people have said, and actually my publisher may have even put this in the language on the cover, in the, on the flap, right? Oh, Rabbi Held is saying that Judaism is about love as opposed to law. And no, I never said anything remotely like that. When I say Judaism is about love, I don't mean that to the exclusion of everything else. I mean that it is, Mark, as you sort of suggested, it is sort of a through line that animates the whole thing. So law is one of them. Related to that is that I think Judaism has what I call a more possibilistic view of human nature than major swaths of Christianity. That is to say, for example, if you're a Lutheran, you have the view, or if you're an Orthodox Lutheran, let's say, you have the view that the law is there so that we break ourselves upon it and realize that we are not able to do what God asks of us. In rabbinic spirituality, the law is there to goad us to be more than we otherwise would be. I argue, for whatever it's worth, that Judaism is not optimistic, it's possibilistic. In other words, I don't think Judaism thinks that we will do the good. I think it thinks that we can do the good. Lutherans don't think that. Um, now, I'll just say, I hope this is at least somewhat interesting to people. The most interesting critique that I have received so far in the two weeks that this book has been in the world is that both a Catholic theologian friend and a Wesleyan theologian friend have said you know, you have a tendency for your default portrayal of Christian theology to be Lutheran. As a Catholic, I don't have as dark a view of human nature and human possibility as Lutherans do. And this Wesleyan friend of mine said, yeah, me neither. Wesleyans also don't think like that. It's not that our view is as optimistic or possibilistic as a Jewish view, but, you know, obviously Christianity is a very diverse religion. Sometimes I think there are more Christian denominations than there are Jews. Um, <laughs> but, so those are, those are the two small ones. Um, they're not small, they're just sort of easy to articulate. The, the third is a huge one, but it's hard to talk about because there's so much stereotype here that it's hard to think our way out from under it. And that is the question of love of enemies. It is kind of a conventional, almost cliche, that Christianity teaches us to love our enemies and Judaism says something else. And you can fill in your blank. There are all kinds of different versions of this. Now, one of the things I set out to do in this book is to show that many of the themes that are traditionally associated with loving enemies in Christianity are also central to rabbinic Judaism. 
just to give you one example, the ethic of non-retaliation is so fundamental to rabbinic spirituality and ethics. And I say this, it's funny, I, I've said this over the years sometimes to very from kids who daven three times a day. I say, you know that in the Amida every day, three times, you pray to be capable of non-retaliation. And almost inevitably, people look at me like, what are you talking about? I literally had the experience the other day where I saw a kid start saying the Amida in her head, trying to figure out what I was talking about, right? And I said, you know, at the end of the Amida, you say, And to those who curse me, may my soul remain silent. And the rabbis valorize those who are insulted but refuse to insult in return. Now, I'm not getting into right now whether what you think of that ethic. I'm just sort of suggesting that a lot of what we associate with Christianity is actually traditionally Jewish. The rabbis are obsessed with the idea that in the interpersonal sphere, reconciliation is always the lichat chila goal. It is always the preferable option. You know, I, I, I often talk about this story that is so simple, but it, I, I just find it very moving. So I'll share it with you if, if that's okay, which is the rabbis tell this story about two donkey drivers, one of whom is walking on the way and when he sees his fellow donkey drivers um, donkey fallen on the ground, and they do not get along. And as you might know from biblical law, it's an explicit biblical law, if you see your enemy's donkey fallen, you must raise him. But he doesn't like this guy, so he keeps walking. And he gets, you know, whatever it is, 100 yards away, and he realizes, oh wait, the Torah says I'm not supposed to conduct myself like this. So he goes back, and he helps him lift the donkey. I mean, this is a very simple story, but it's so interesting what the rabbis are trying to do here. He helps the guy raise his donkey, and they start chatting. And the guy he helps invites him to go for a drink, and they sit in an inn together, and they realize they actually like each other. And the Midrash then comments, this is what it means when we say that God's laws are righteous. Meaning, I think, that what starts as obedience to a law ends in the restoration of a relationship. Now, where I think there is a gap between Jews and some Christians, I'll explain what I mean in a second. I'm sorry, this is a long-winded answer, but you asked a very big question. Where I think there is a, a difference between Judaism and Christianity on this point is that I think Judaism has historically been much more ambivalent about the question of loving, brutal, murderous, tyrannical enemies. I'm not saying that it's absent, but I'm saying that Judaism has had a more, I would say, realistic view of this question. And one of the things that I've suggested that both, I mean, this is a little chutzpahdik thing to say, that both the Jewish and Christian conversations about enemies suffers from is not enough attention to defining our terms. Like, when I talk about an enemy, am I talking about, like, Butch Pemstein? Like, I don't get along with him, right? Um, <laughs> That was a joke, by the way. Um, am I, am I, what, so am I talking about a guy I just don't get along with? Am I talking about a rival at work? Am I talking about a cousin I used to own a business with, but we fell out? Or am I talking about Saddam Hussein or Bashar Assad? Right? It's not obvious to me that you would say the same thing about my relationship with all those people. And yet when we say enemies as this catch-all term, like we need a lot more clarification of what we're talking about. Now, where this gets complicated is that Christians will tend to say things like, love of enemies is at the very heart of the ethic Jesus teaches. I don't think you would say that about rabbinic Judaism. But more importantly, or at least as importantly, Christians have never been able to agree about what that actually means. So just to take one example that has political ramifications, does love of enemies demand pacifism? Or does it actually mean that I have to stop people when they're about to act in horrific ways? Not totally obvious, right? And there's a million examples of this. But I think that, that there's a difference in that, whereas the rabbinic tradition places emphasis on loving enemies in, in certain circumstances, 
Christian, Christians tend to talk about it as if it's the very center of an ethical project. I would also note as a footnote that I think that Jews, um, it surely matters that much of the history, not the origins, but much of the history of Christian conversation about love of enemies has taken place when Christians were powerful and much of the Jewish conversation has taken place where Jews were powerless. That is surely significant and worth thinking about. Also, Christians have made Jews very suspicious of love of enemies because Christians preached love of enemies, then defined Jews as enemies and murdered them. Right? I recently said this to a Christian audience and it was great. We had a, a good, I would say a good time was had by all. Searing honesty. Um, look, I, this is just thing I believe. I, you know, I think interfaith dialogue where people get together and are polite is like lovely, but I have better things to do. Um, no, really. I mean, if we're going to really have conversations, first of all, we're going to have it on equal terms. And second of all, without being horrible people, we're going to be honest. There can't be a new relationship between Judaism and Christianity without being able to talk about how Jews experienced Christianity for 2,000 years. That just can't be. Um, now, I, I literally did not know this was going to happen, but I can't remember what the fourth one was. <laughs> what was I going to say? I, I, I don't even know. It'll come to you when I It'll ask you this It'll come to me. I'm sorry. Question. You know okay. what? It's a, good, it's a good excuse to get me to shut up and let Mark talk, so great. Oh, good. Um, I'm thinking a lot. So first of all, the, the, this is not just a book of theology, just so everybody knows. There's implications here for parenting and being teachers, and I would say leadership, and so many, and just and friendship. I mean, you can't write a book about love that doesn't have implications for relationships. Um, I, I was thinking about when you wrote about unconditional love. First of all, that itself is like, you know, unconditional love talk amongst yourselves, you know, like what, is it, what does it actually mean? But yeah. one of the things that I, I found myself maybe even reacting to a little bit and then observing my own biases was, so I wrote down here, um, I think some people, not me, might be afraid of unconditional love as being like soft or as lacking in accountability or moral rigor. Like that there's a kind of like learned dichotomy between either I love you unconditionally or I have expectations of you and I hold you accountable. And I think that also plays its way into Judaism, which we have always say, you know, cares more about actions and is a moral tradition. So can you talk about that dichotomy or lack thereof between unconditional love and moral rigor and accountability? Yeah, thank you for that question, which is actually quite important to me, um, both theologically and ethically. I think it is very important to make a distinction that many of us get tripped up on, sometimes consciously, but often unconsciously, and that is confusing conditions with expectations. Sometimes parents think that loving my child unconditionally means I can't really have expectations of them. And so if I have expectations of my kids, then I'm making my love for them conditional. This seems to me to be exactly backwards Right? I would say that for Jewish theology, love amplifies expectation. The whole reason why Israel is held to account biblically, in a sense, is that God loves us unconditionally. Right? That's the famous verse in, in the third chapter of Amos. You alone have I singled out among the nations of the earth. Therefore, I'll right? kod Therefore, I'll hold you account for all of your hold you to account for all of your sins. I, I do think there is some real confusion here. Um, and unconditional love that does not articulate expectation makes narcissists or entitled kids who, you know, don't have a sense that other people make a claim on them. But expectations without unconditional love make people feel like they're constantly having to earn their worth and their value. And both of those things are toxic for a sense of well-being and an ability to flourish in, in, in relationship with people. So I, I, you know, I think this is actually really hard. I mean, one of the things that I sort of, in the Bible's understanding of what it means to be a human person is precisely the idea, this kind of radical idea that isn't obvious, that God takes us seriously as agents. 
right? God believes in our ability to shape the world we inhabit. And if you take the Bible seriously, God is often disappointed. But that, that's the claim. And, and, so, and that is tied up with the unconditional love. Now, I, I argue for whatever it's worth theologically that um, one of the claims of the prophet Hosea is that what makes God God and not a person is precisely that God's love is entirely unconditional. Human beings are on some level incapable of truly unconditional love. And God says, Ela no velo ish. I'm, I'm God. My love is truly, unfathomably inexhaustible. That's a really powerful theological claim, I think. Um, and if I may be anachronistic, it is Hosea's assault on medieval philosophy, right? Medieval philosophers say, oh, God loves us. Oh, but God is not a person, so God doesn't really love us. Hosea says, oh, God loves us, but God is not a person, meaning God loves us to an extent and with an intensity and commitment that we're not even remotely capable of. That's a totally different thing. That is Hosea slapping Maimonides around. Interesting. I, I was thinking about this, book, but I, I don't know that we want to talk about it now, but the book doesn't really get into the rationalistic versus mystical notions of God and theology, although I, th I think it's running through here everywhere. But one of the, I think one of the, since you mentioned slapping around the great philosophical rationalist, um, <laughs> the, like one of the shortcomings of a rationalist theology, which so many of us have internalized as just Judaism, I think, um, is that it actually resists anthropomorphism and limits our capacity to, to have hu deep human emotions, relationships, connection with the divine, which might also limit our capacities. In other ways, I think it's, it's just interesting when you put love at the center. I think it invites a more personal relationship with God. Yeah, and if, if, if I could say something a tiny bit obscure for a minute, I think that there is something really off about our tendency to assume that love is somehow an exclusively human thing. Um, and I say this in two directions. First of all, the biblical insistence that love is central to who God is. And second of all, the research in primatology in the last several decades that suggests a level of compassion. I mean, Franz Dewal just passed away um, a couple weeks ago, um, and who was one of the great Certainly, I would say one of the most popular primatologists that you know in our culture, and you know, Dewal spent years writing about compassion and the roots of empathy. Um, that was also part of our evolutionary heritage, and so, in other words, the notion that love is somehow exclusively human, that it can't be higher up than us, and it can't be as it were, lower down than us, is a weird form of human triumphalism that I just reject. I, ju I, I just think, don't think that that makes philosophical sense. Um, I always think about probably the line in Abraham Joshua Heschel's writing that has been most important for me as a philosophy person, as opposed to like spiritually, is this wonderful line when he says, attributing love to God is not anthropomorphism attributing love to humans is theomorphism. As they used to say when I was about 18, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Um, That's so Heschel. Um, not the smoking the pipe. Not that part. I don't know. But OK. Uh, I want to just note, in, I, I want to just like kind of just reflect back a phrase that I'm sure most of us heard you say, but I just loved it. And it's one of my takeaways already from this conversation, which is love that makes a claim on you. I just think it's a very powerful notion, and it made me think about the idea of tochacha, of rebuke, which we, I, I don't know that, it, I, I might have missed it in here, but, talk about it a little bit, but, yeah. but uh, the, the commandment to rebuke your fellow person actually, I think, is very tied up with this idea that I love you, therefore, I not only have the right 
to give you hard feedback. I actually may have the obligation to give you hard feedback. I mean, I personally like to translate tochecha as loving rebuke. And one thing I just like to reflect on and hear your thoughts on is that I think we are, I think we are actually in a desperate need for a revolution of tochecha. Meaning, um, I think we are not good at critique in our world right now. And there, I, I feel there is this, there is a, a, a dichotomy between I love you and therefore I will not criticize you, or I criticize you not from the inside, from a place of love, but from a place of outside. You know, I can't bring myself to love you because I'm so critical of you. You know, I'm just curious what your take is on that. Yeah, so, I mean, thank you for, for <laughs> sort of underscoring that notion of love that makes a claim on us. You know, I think that there is a dichotomy that is sometimes found in sort of popular conversation, a dichotomy between acting from love and acting from duty. <laughs> and I actually think that that dichotomy is way too simplistic. When I give my kids breakfast in the morning, Am I acting because it is an obligation I have towards them or because I love them? I'm not talking about like last Thursday when I was in a bad mood, right? I'm talking about, you know, like in general, why do I do that? Why do I do it? Well, yes, I do it because I love them and I'm obligated to them. And in fact, that obligation is tied up with the love. When I am feeling like all I want to do is, oh, this is Boston, I should be careful. All I want to do is go home and watch the Yankee game. And, and boo, yeah, I know. Um, I, all I want to do is go home and watch the Yankee game, and I come home and my wife is not feeling well, and I say, you know what, sorry, but the Yankees are on, right? Do not try this at home. The point is, the point is, like, in that, my love for her makes a claim on me, which is that I have to respond to her needs in that moment. So, in other words, love is not, like, a hallmark feeling, Love is intensely demanding. Growing in love is the task of a lifetime. Growing in love is a practice, a commitment, a, a non-linear growth process. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm totally, I think that's totally right. Now, I don't know if you meant this, Mark, but invoking rebuke or toch, or loving rebuke, is deeply related to this whole question about conditions and expectations. Right? It's, total, it's the same conversation, which is, if I see my child speaking in a cruel way to another child, my love for him requires me to talk to him about how he's spoken. It doesn't mean that I say, oh, it's my kid. I mean, I've seen this. You've all probably seen this with parents, right, whose instinct is always, my kid did no wrong. Right? You all, I mean, some of you are teachers. You see this, right? And that's exactly backwards, right? Which is, oh, you behaved in this way, and I love you and have to correct your course here. That, that I think, is, 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 is really fun. And it's very hard, right? I love you, and therefore, I hold you accountable. Yes, that's, that again, is... that's Amos. And, yeah. and, and we don't live in a culture, I mean, I don't know if I really want to go down this abyss right now, but we don't live in a culture in which people are open to being rebuked. You try to rebuke someone, and their main response will be, stop gaslighting me. Um, even if you love them, if you try to rebuke them lovingly. And it's very, very hard. I mean, I also think some of you are college professors. You know that you know, it, we also live in a time where for many millennials, you can't actually offer any challenge to their way of thinking about the world lest you quote unquote make them feel unsafe. Um, that's not a great way to facilitate growth. I'm not saying that as some kind of like right-wing reactionary. I just think it's basic psychology that is just not, it's not a helpful way of creating human interaction. Um, we, we are probably correcting for things that were equally broken, but the pendulum will God willing swing, swing back. Yeah, I'll just note, and then I want to ask you an, a, a different question, that I think in our time of kind of toxic polarization, it seems that um, one of the reasons people cannot... First of all, we tend to be much more interested in criticizing or even demonizing people with whom we actually don't have loving relationships, right? We, something is broken about this. And, um, and it's not 
coincidental that people don't receive rebuke well when they don't actually feel loved by the person giving it. And I'll just say out loud, I think one of the things we need to think about as a community is to be a reflective, moral, loving community that holds ourselves and one another to high standards. We also have to invest in deepening the love, especially between people we don't feel proximate to, even within our own community. You know, the, so, the, uh, yeah. I just want to note that the data on the number of Jews on different ends of the spectrum who, who say, I don't even feel like they're part of my community anymore is, is frightening when you think but not only about the unity of the Jewish people, but about the fact that that unity and the love that comes from it is the very thing that enables us to hold each other to high expectations and be the best version of ourselves. Well, I think there's a larger, even, even more fundamental issue than what you're pointing to, which is the ways in which we tend to deflect religious and ethical critique by assuming it only applies to other people. Right? There's a, a, a story that I've often shared. It's one of my favorite Jewish jokes. A rabbi gets up on Yom Kippur, and for 45 minutes, he lambasts the community for their moral failings, for the ways that they're cheaters, and they're liars, and they're corrupt. And at the end of davening, he's really surprised when the entire shul lines up to greet him and thank him. And everyone says the same thing. Yishar Koach, rabbi, you really told them. That is such a powerful <laughs> view of where religion goes wrong yep. or where ethical critique goes wrong. And I think we all do that to some degree. Yep. We all do that to some degree, which is like, oh, yeah, I'm glad the prophet said that. He thinks the same things of my enemies than I do. But what about me? What about my family? I once had an experience at Hadar, um, the very early on at Hadar. And I, yes, I was a little bit less... I would say refined back then. A woman got up after a talk I gave about, I don't even remember what, and she said, the Haredim, and by the way, any time any liberal rabbi says the Orthodox, you should ideally ask them to stop because they're already talking in stereotypes. Who are they talking about? A Bratislav or Chassid? a modern Orthodox high school student, what are they talking with the Orthodox? I mean, what does that even mean? But she says, you know, the Haredim, and she starts talking about the way that they are, um, in her language, xenophobic. And so I said, listen, I mean you no disrespect, but I want to say the following thing. When your synagogue does Bikr Cholim, like Satmer, you can get up in this space and bash Haredim. Until then, I think it would be more helpful if you talked about all the ways that your reform synagogue is failing. It's just a more helpful way to go through the world. I don't think she appreciated being told that, <laughs> but, but I thought it was important because like, oh, liberal Jews are gonna get together and bash ultra-Orthodox Jews, so that's lovely. Like, great, we haven't done that enough. You know what I mean? But let's talk about the ways that our community fails, right? Let's talk about, I don't know, perish the thought. What are the ways that Emmanuel is an inadequate community? This is my last appearance at Emmanuel. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I mean, prefer to think of it as had not, have not yet fully lived out its possibility. That's why you had a federation and I'm unemployed. <laughs> there but you yes. go. Um, yeah, yeah, good. All right, I want to move to a, what, I, what for me is actually one of the most pressing themes that you bring up in this book, because I'm thinking about it a lot as I try to make sense of some of the challenges we're facing today, <laughs> politically, intergenerationally, etc. So um, in the section on loving our own and everyone else too, we're going to talk about universalism and particularism now. You reference um, the Princeton philosopher Peter Singer, who um, holds up a notion, I think, of ethics that, that demands us to be completely impartial. And then you say, and I love this, I told you this because I hadn't heard this term before, um, you use the term partialists. Partialists, myself included, that's you referring to yourself, reject this kind of thinking out of hand, allowing that, quote, it is not merely psychologically understandable, but morally correct to favor one's own, those with whom we have personal ties of some kind. So can you talk to us about partialism? And um, 
why it may be not only okay, but morally correct in your view to um, be partial to some more than others? You just reminded me what the fourth thing I wanted to say about <laughs> Jews and Christians was. It's amazing. I'm going to take Mark everywhere. He's going to be my. If I just talk long enough, eventually you'll get the fourth. Which one of us is Batman and which one of us is Robin? <laughs> so, so um, there are strands in Christianity that insist that the universal always comes first. So that you'll have certain Christian thinkers, again, they tend to be Lutherans, who will say, oh, love your neighbor. That means love every human being in the world equally, what philosophers call equal regard. Um, many Christians, especially Catholics, are like, well, that seems insane, right, and impossible. No Jew has ever considered seriously the possibility that we are obligated to love every human being in the world equally. And I think there's actually interesting things to say about why that is. But to your question more directly, um, so, Impartialists are essentially people who argue like this Lutheran view that what ethics requires is that every human being in the world be given absolutely equal consideration by me. In philosophy, this is a view held by, by some utilitarians like Peter Singer. Now, the problem with this is, it seems to me, that it is both psychologically and morally untenable. It is psychologically untenable because you could probably spend the rest of your life trying to convince yourself to love my kids as much as you love yours, and it won't happen. And I argue based on a rabbinic principle, Eina Kodesh Baruch Hu Babitron Yayim Habriot, or if you are a grammarian, Bitirun Yayim Habriot, God doesn't make expectations that are impossible to meet that Jewish ethics wants to work with the grain of nature rather than against it. And to work with the grain of nature is to say, oh, you love your spouse, you love your kids, you love your friends, can we take that and build it further out rather than overriding it and giving it no weight? Is it clear what I'm trying to say here? I just want to make sure I'm, I'm not being too obscure, right? In other words, so, in other words, great. You love your children. You know, that guy over there is also someone's child. Maybe his suffering can make a claim on you. Now, I don't think we should assume that this is simple, because as we know, family first deteriorates all the time into family only. Right? Partialism has its costs. I just think the alternative is untenable psychologically and also as I was starting to say is morally sort of bizarre if I said to you you know I'm not really sure whose tuition I should pay first your child or mine you would probably regard me as some kind of moral leper like or it's just like a some bizarre character, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, this is a moment in one of Peter Singer's books, he actually says something like, if I was in Africa and there were two starving children in front of me and I had one bowl of rice, I would like to think that I would not prioritize my child. And several philosophers have responded to this by saying, you know, you're actually just at, at, out of your mind. Right, like that is no longer functioning as a human being functions, right? Um, so I would say that for Jewish communities, the challenge is how do we genuinely expand our sense of who we care about? And the crucial question that most of us, probably all of us would prefer to avoid is, okay, so I have to feed my children before I feed your children, but how much pampering of my children do I do before I feed your children? Do they need to have two nice vacations a year? Do they need to go to schools that are more expensive than most people in the world's houses? Right, I mean, those are real questions. And I think it's fair to say that most of us would much prefer to make those questions go away because they're really hard. 
So I don't mean, when I say you know, that I'm a partialist, I don't mean that I think partialism is great and we should all be happy with ourselves. We have much greater responsibilities to people who lack than we like to admit or be honest about. But I don't think the way to get there is to pretend to be utter impartialists. Um, one of the most obnoxious things ever written, literally, I mean, this is a great beginning, right? Aren't you curious now? One of, <laughs> sometime in the 1990s, a philosopher named Peter Berkowitz wrote an essay in the New Republic. This is really, I can't believe I'm sharing this, but it's really interesting, actually. He wrote an essay in the New Republic in which he was reviewing Peter Singer's vision of utilitarianism, and he said, you know, I became curious. So I did some research about Peter, about Peter Singer's parents, and it turns out that Peter Singer's mother has Alzheimer's, and Peter Singer keeps her in a very high-end, um, extremely careful, you know, ex you know like a, ex extremely high-end care place. Um, so even Peter Singer doesn't believe what Peter Singer says. And Peter Singer writes a letter to the New Republic and says, I never respond to ad hominem attacks. I'm appalled by this. To which Peter Berkowitz says, attack? The whole point was that you're a better person than your philosophy. That's what I was trying to say, which is that even you know, even you know that your ideas are ridiculous. Of course you're gonna take care of your mother. So that's what I'm trying to make room for, but again, not in the sense of just bolstering upper class privilege. Oh, I take care of my kids. You know, I send them to a $700,000 a year Jewish private school. No, right? It's, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually, it's actually, in other words, to embrace partialism is the first step. It is surely not the last one. So I, I want to just say thank you for that because I feel like that was a kind of like an explanation of partialism and a moral caveat on, on partialism and one that we should be thinking about. And I appreciate it. I, I want to ask you a question from another lens because it's something I have not stopped thinking about since I read that piece, especially as we go into Passover. And here I'm going to ask you to be an observer of what's going on in our world right now um, without necessarily asking you to comment on, it, comment on any particular um, things that are happening. But I think a lot of us are anxious about the intergenerational conversations that are going to be happening at our Passover seders um, because I think that um, we have significant um, divergence. It's, it's not exclusively generational divergence, but that's a major piece of how we're making sense of the world right now, obviously in particular what's going on in Israel. And when I read this, I thought this is a helpful framework for diagnosing that because I think there may be a gap in partialism oh, yeah. generationally. And um, by the way, when you are a partialist, it's really hard to um, have empathy for impartialist. Or again, like particularism in universal. And vice versa. Like I, think, I actually think this is a way to think about the four children in the Passover, Seder, that like part of what that Russia wicked child is saying is like your story is not my story, which is like I don't know of you But like when your kid says that or even hints at it as a parent you're like, oh You know like I feel like you're rejecting me when you are not partialist enough so um, this is my um, Kind of just reflection and observation I'm curious whether you think this is a helpful tool for making sense of kind of the Jewish community as we are right now and what we might do about it Yeah, I mean, I think this is actually a really hard question because I think it applies to some interpersonal conflicts around Israel, but certainly not to all, right? I think it is certainly the case that you have many kids, kids, young adults. Um, it's amazing how the age of kids goes, as, goes, goes up as you go up, right? <laughs> My mother used to refer to anyone under 70 as Yelid. Um, <laughs> so... Um, you know, there certainly are young Jewish adults who take the posture, I would never prioritize Jews over anyone else. I don't prioritize anyone over anyone else. Now, it happens to be that I don't believe them in the sense that something my, my colleague Ethan Tucker pointed out to me a long time ago, it's not really that some people don't have partial commitments. Not, not halfway commitments, but commitments in a, in a partiality kind of way. 
it's that their understanding of who they're partial to is different, right? So it's not the Jews, it's the people in my neighborhood. It's not the Jews, it's the like, you know, it, and so, I, I, you know, I don't know if there are any impartialists in real life. Um, I, I think another dimension of this, and again, this is not true for everyone, but I think also that we as a community are reaping the consequences of being a minority culture in a Protestant country in which Protestantism is all about the individual. And one of the things that I see with a lot of young adults is that a robust sense of we is really very hard. And many of us as their parents and grandparents look at them like they're Martian because we drank that as mother's milk. That is a very hard thing and is really worth thinking about. Now, the reason I would insist that it's not true in all cases is that you have some people who believe very deeply that the Judaism they're passionate about and the Jewish community they believe in leads them to places that many of us find, let's say, let's put a nice word, disturbing, right? Now, and the last thing I wanna do right here is talk about you know, my view of Israel, Palestine, politics, that's not, right? But I think one of the challenges we do face is holding the views we hold with integrity and not losing the humanity of people that we strongly disagree with. Um, that is not always an easy thing to do. Few of you have heard me share this story, so forgive me, but the other night at Harvard Hillel, I'm sorry, last week um, at, um, at B'nai Jeshurun in Manhattan, you can see that I'm living out of a suitcase. Last week at B'nai Jeshurun in Manhattan, um, I, had the privilege of launching my book in a conversation with Congressman Jamie Raskin. And he, he shared this story that has really, I, I honestly have not been able to stop thinking about it in the nine or 10 days since that event. And it's relevant here. He, we, someone asked us on stage about love of enemies. And um, Jamie Raskin said, I would like to share with you that one of my closest friends in Congress is Lauren Boebert. And then he explained why. He said, you know, when I was diagnosed with lymphoma, Lauren Boebert came to the hospital with me. Lauren Boebert never stopped reaching out to me and saying, Jamie, how are you? And he said, you know, Lauren Boebert is wrong about literally everything. <laughs> He's like, but you know what? She's still capable of love. And it enables me to see something that most of the time we don't see. And then because he's Jamie Raskin and he happens to be hilarious, he says, notice I am not talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, <laughs> but, but, but the point is, I, so when, 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 when Jamie shared that, I mean, it really touched me very deeply, right? Because we live in a, in a moment where, oh, right? I love my child as long as I don't vote for Ben Gvir, right? I mean, I do feel that way a lot of the time, but if, God forbid, my child had reprehensible political views, I hope I would still see them as a person capable of love and kindness. And that means that although I can be on, you know, difficult terms, I can't write them off. I can't dehumanize them. I can't see them as, you know, finish that sentence however you want, really. And I think that that's really, really important and really hard, and right now our culture facilitates the opposite of that. Our cultural really facilitates the opposite. I recently finished reading a book by Tim Alberta, who some of you may be familiar with. Tim Alberta is a political reporter and a very devout evangelical. And here, I just want to say, I'm about to share this, not because I'm making some kind of veiled political speech, but because I want to explain his perspective. Tim Alberta's book is a kind of creed de cur about how he believes that MAGA has destroyed American evangelicalism. And there's a moment in the book that, it's not the main moment of the book, but there's a moment that I found really very moving where he says, talking about the church that his father, I think, if I remember correctly, that his father pastors. He says, you know, I'm looking around this room and there are all these people 
who say the most reprehensible things in the name of Jesus, right? Just horrific. They talk about loving their enemies and they wear Let's Go Brandon t-shirts, right? I mean, right? He says it's just unbearable. And then he says, and you know, some of these people I'm looking at, I know, spend every Tuesday night cooking dinner in a homeless shelter. And like, they're not monsters, they're just wrong. And I think that that's actually important if we want to find a way to live together. And it's certainly important in families. You can think your kids are wrong, they probably think you're wrong. <laughs> By the way, that's true no matter what you think. You could be on the far left, on the far right, or anything in between. Your kids will think you're wrong, <laughs> right? And you might think they're wrong. And you can love each other and see the kind of irreducible humanity of each other. I, I think that that's actually, it feels like a little, but it's an awful lot. Mm. Beautiful, powerful. I want to remind you there are cards on your table if you have questions. Ellie, this was the time we said we were going to try to move to some questions. Do you want to share them? Okay, I'll ask one more while he's still collecting, and then we'll spend our last 15 minutes on questions. Um, and by the way, we're ending by 12. There's many people in the room who want to get to the, to the rededication of the hostage poster wall. We'll Not to sure mention to buying 25, 30 copies of your book. And, and having um, it signed by Shai Held. Sorry about that. That's, um, I'm, I'm, this is a personal question for you, because, and I'm, I'm taking the privilege of asking it as someone who does have um, a, a formal leadership role, but... Um, I wanted to just bring to everyone's attention because they may not have seen it or watched it recently, but years ago, you gave um, an Eli talk, which was for a while the Avichai Foundation of Blessed Memory was doing, um, was doing these like TED talks for Jewish education and Jewish life. And if I recall correctly, which I hope I do since I gave a graduation speech about it, you, you gave a talk about heart leaders. Yeah. And... Um, Shai spoke in there about how we, everyone talks about thought leaders, thought leaders, thought leaders, and what we actually need more of is heart leaders. So I would just love to hear, um, you know, yeah, first of all, I don't know how much you even remember that, but what do you think the implications are for love on leadership? And especially today, right now, within our Jewish community beyond, when I would say we may have a bit of a crisis in moral leadership, a crisis in heart leadership, like what, what does this book call on um, leaders? to do? Or who, who does it call on leaders to be? Yeah, that's a, a great and hard question. And I'll start just by sharing my own prejudices. There are very few words that I find more distasteful than thought leader. Um, I mean, <laughs> with all due respect, don't flatter yourself. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just like a, I mean, it's just like a very, I, I, I don't know, it's just very grandiose in ways that, and I think, you know, there are very few thought leaders in the generation. Um, and they're usually not people who have thought leader in their little bio. Um, so, um, I know I say I'm about love, but when the gloves come off. Um, I love everyone but thought leaders. Exactly. I love everyone but those who are disagreeing with me. Um, so, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, I'll say it in a negative way and then in a positive way. I think that what makes Jewish culture so spectacular, part of what makes it so spectacular, is its commitment to the life of the mind. And I think one of the dangers of Jewish culture is to valorize people who excel at that and end up making invisible people who excel at other things. Um, and I think that one of the ways that is manifest in leadership is that we have people in the Jewish community who are considered and then people use words also kind of promiscuously, brilliant, right? And the fact that they don't actually see a human being in front of them doesn't really matter because after all, they're brilliant. Um, you know, my wife always likes to say, you know, me too came for the men who sexually abused women, but as for the men who just abused people, right, th that somehow, you know, we don't talk about that, right? So I, I think that, like, I, I think it's, it's just very complicated. Now, what heart leadership means to me is that a real leader leads, first of all, with empathy and a commitment to seeing other people's humanity, period, sof pasuk. 
And if we don't do that, we have no business pretending to be leaders and certainly not Jewish leaders. So, 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 you know, that, and that, and I think that that applies kind of seamlessly from everything like greeting people to the way we talk about politics. Not necessarily what views we hold, I'm not suggesting there's one answer to most political questions, but like, how do we talk to and about people? Um, I think also there's a way in which, I, 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 so years ago, I went to the then editor of the Jewish Daily Forward, and I said, I have a suggestion. Just want to sort of run this by you. This year, instead of listing the 50 most prominent Jews in the world, how about you list 50 unsung heroes in the Jewish community? A woman who runs a nursery school for autistic kids. A chaplain in an old age home whose congregants don't talk about him because they can't remember him from day to day. Like, how about that? What kind of statement would it make if you said these are the 50 most the Jews we should recognize? I got nowhere. I got no traction at all on this. Um, but it seemed really important to me. And by the way, we do this even in the rabbinate, right? And here, I hope this doesn't sound gross, but it's really, I think it's actually really important. Who are the people we discuss in America as great rabbis? They're almost never congregational rabbis. They're almost never people who are like making minion in the evening, right? They are people who write things that are important. And I understand the irony of, of my saying this, but it's actually, that's why I feel like I can say it. Like, I'm not the greatest rabbi in America. The greatest rabbi in America is someone I guess most of you have never heard of. Probably someone I haven't heard of. And I just wonder what would happen if we had a community that really took that to heart. Right? Like, chaplains in Alzheimer's units are the great rabbis in this country. They are the heart leaders of this community. And I, I just, like, there's a kind of reorientation that would happen ideally. That's, I mean, you know, that, that's, in that same Eli talk, I remember actually saying, you know, my dream for a Jewish world, I might have even said this in this book too, I don't remember. My, my, my dream of a Jewish community is that when people pass a Hillel house or a shul or a, you know, a JCC or whatever, they think, oh, that's a Jewish institution. That must be a bastion of kindness. Right? Like, that's my dream. Like, I have a dream for the Jewish community. I want us to be known for our kindness. And by the way, not just upper middle class Jews to other upper middle class Jews, but upper middle class Jews to our neighbors who are not in our tax bracket. As I used to say to my college students, not the people who live in your building, but also the people who live under it. What, what about that? What about taking on the mission of being a community that is truly animated by love? That's hard work. But boy, is it worth it. If you value the idea of a Kiddush Hashem, of sanctifying God's name, then that would be a really nice way to go about it. Mm. Thank you. Rav Shai, here are a couple of questions that focus, I think, in a similar vein, but might allow you to, to expand more fully in different directions. One question is, is trying to wrestle with uh, an idea that was there a shift in rabbinic Judaism from focusing on acts of chesed to focusing on love? It's like, what's... For, it's a lot of what you talk about, but here someone's okay. asking, it's like, how do those fit together? Which is, I think, something that you care deeply that it's obvious they fit together, but just spelling it out a little bit more. Um, and another question, not just acts of chesed and love, but also how does this fit in with the notion of kedusha? Like, if you can talk yeah, a little bit about great. This. sanctity, kedusha, holiness. So, to, to your first question, if I understood it correctly, I, to me it's important to, to emphasize that love is an umbrella term for a whole series of postures we take towards other people. It includes things like compassion, gratitude, kindness, what psychologists tend to refer to as pro-social emotions. Um, 
or research psychologists tend to refer to as pro-social emotions. I, I think that um, it's really, it was really striking to me as I was kind of nearing the end of working on this book to realize that there was this emerging group of moral philosophers who were also saying love is not a particular thing, it's an umbrella for a whole bunch of different things. Um, the example of this that I often give is that it was really striking to me I don't remember when I first realized this, but it really like kind of took my breath away to realize this, that in Talmudic Aramaic, in Babylonian Aramaic, there is no way to distinguish compassion and love. The root for love in Aramaic is reish chet mem. Right? Rachama means love. So when I say God is rachamana, is God, does that mean that God is merciful or loving? The answer is yeah. Right? It's exactly what it means. And so w I would never distinguish between acts of chesed and love. Acts of chesed are a great manifestation of love. Um, I don't really see, I have to think about this more, I don't really see a huge shift off the top of my head, Bible to the rabbis on this. Um, but I have to think about that more. Um, I'm not quite sure I, I have that, the answer to that worked out. But I think, you know, acts of compassion are acts of love. Again, we, we, we have to, I think, remember that love is not just the passion I feel for a spouse. And by the way, as I also talk about a little bit in this book, even the passion I feel for a spouse is not the love I feel for a spouse. Because I love my wife even when I don't feel passion at all. I've, I love my wife when all I can think about is and I'm more grumpy than Butch Pemstein, right? Um, right? <laughs> Sorry, Butch. What'd you say? Yeah, totally. Um, right, no, I think that's actually really important. And, and, and one of the things, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll just sort of, sort of add this. I, I think that if I'm making one kind of central claim about how we define love, it is on some level that love is not an emotion. Love is an existential posture. Love is the way we hold ourselves in the world. Love is a stance, an orientation that manifests at times in emotion. And that must manifest in emotion or else the posture will dissipate. But it itself is not an emotion. So I love my wife even when, honestly, like I'm feeling numb. Like here's, here's uh, let me give you a really ridiculous example. If you had asked me, on the evening of October 7th, do you love your kids emotionally? I would have said, I don't know, I can't feel anything. But if you said to me, do you love your kids? I would say, are you kidding more than anything in the world? That's not incoherent, that's actually about thinking about love in more sophisticated ways, which I think is helpful. When we tell people, build your life around the emotion of love, we prescribe disappointment, because nobody can do that. Emotions ebb and flow. Emotions come and go, right? I always tell people, if you don't know what I mean, try meditating for 15 seconds and watch your feelings shift. You ever had the experience of being in a really good mood and then finding yourself what feels like minutes later sort of ruining the day you were born, right? Like, that's, that's actually how feelings work sometimes. You can't build a spiritual life on a feeling. You build it on a posture, on an, or, or if, if you prefer more philosophical, on a disposition to feel certain things and a disposition to act in certain ways. That's what love is. Rav Shai, there are a couple of questions here that kind of lead from that and saying if love is a posture, is a disposition, is a spiritual practice perhaps, how might we work on it? Like what steps, what things can we think about, do, practice in order to grow and be more available for that posture more of the time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys realize that when we said this would end at noon, we meant Monday at noon. <laughs> um, that's okay, Wes will be fine at the wall by himself. Um, no, I'm kidding. Okay, so, so, um, 
what you asked me. Uh, <laughs> developing that posture. Oh, yeah, yeah pregnant. Yeah. So let me, let me say a couple things about this. One is that I think it's important to sort of nuance or refine one way people sometimes think about traditional Jewish approaches to this. A very central rabbinic idea is the principle of mitoch shelo lishma balishma, that out of doing things for the wrong reasons, I can come to do them for the right reasons. There was a great 20th century Musser figure named Rabbi Eliyahu Lopian, known as Reb Elia. And in his um, book, set of volumes called Lev Eliyahu, he again and again comes back to making a claim that I think is really interesting. He says, you know, people sometimes think, oh, so like just do compassionate things and you'll come to feel compassionate. This is actually not true. The way it works is if you do the compassionate things and have the intention, I really hope this also opens my heart so next time I can do it more fully. Right? There's nothing automatic about growing in love. And I also find it interesting, by the way, that Aristotle scholars have for 200 years now been arguing about when Aristotle talks about habituation in the virtues, does he mean that if you just fake it long enough, you'll make it? Or does he mean that I have to constantly work with myself? And the dominant view, I think, I'm not an Aristotle scholar, but the dominant view, I think, is the latter. So I think that that's actually important. So, it's, it's, so what you do when you're not feeling compassion is act compassionately. And that's one of the ways that law functions as a backup motivation for virtue, right? If you're in the hospital, and the main thing I can think about is that the Yankees are on, the law says, get in the car and go to the hospital. But the ideal says, get in the car and go to the hospital because you care that someone's there, <coughs> right? So that's, that's piece number one. The other thing is, I think there are modalities that can, and I wanna like underline the word can many times, help us become more available for other people. Things like therapy and meditation. However, and by the way, I would say Talmud Torah, done in a particular way. But I think that we have to be careful lest we have the illusion that some modalities are automatic. Psychotherapy can make us more narcissistic than when we started. Meditation can be a way around doing the work of growing in love rather than doing it. So, you know, I, I'm always very suspicious of um, anyone who says things like, oh, well, if we all just meditated, the world would be a more loving place. I mean, maybe, but probably not. I mean, if we all just meditated with a particular kind of attentiveness to it, that's a different conversation. If we all went to therapy with a particular kind of attention to it, that's different. If we learn Torah with the rem keeping in mind that as the sages put it, Torah chilat hag milud chasadim v'sofag milud chasadim, that the very beginning and end of Torah is love, right? That's the sages, it's not me. So that's different. But in other words, one needs to set one's intention and one's hope to grow in that way. It's never automatic. If it was automatic, we'd be off the hook, or at least partially off the hook. But it's not automatic. It takes work. I think we're going to end with your blessing and charge to set our intentions to keep growing in love. That's a really powerful message. Um, I want to quickly say again, thank you to Temple Emmanuel for hosting us. Uh, thank you to Rav Eli for all the work you do to bring uh, Hadar to Boston. I want to remind everyone that there are books outside for purchase and you can get them signed. And most importantly, of course, on behalf of all of us, Shai, thank you so much.